Okay, today's second paper is by Alan Andliff, who some of you will remember from last year. Alan has been the Canada Research Chair at the University of Victoria since 2003. He's published widely on 20th century subjects, including a recent book on Joseph Boyce. Uh, but the thread, I suppose, that runs through his work over the years has been, of course, anarchism. Uh, unfortunately, he has injected a little bit of anarchy into... <laughs> Our program, when last week he broke his foot, uh, his doctor said he couldn't travel. So his colleague Erin Campbell will read his paper. Erin is Chair of Art History at the University of Victoria. She works on a very different field to Alan. I think early modern domestic interiors. <laughs> Uh, but I want to thank you, Aaron, so much for agreeing to deputise for Alan today. But I've just heard that he is, we are going to patch him in, uh, after the talk, uh, so he will be able to answer questions remotely. So, so that's really good. Uh, so Aaron, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. And, um, I'll just get us underway. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, good, great. So many of us are familiar with Man Ray, the photographer and painter whose involvement in New York's data movement continues to dominate art historical treatments of his activity during the World War I era. Today, I am exploring, Alan is exploring, the painterly formalism that propelled his work up to 1917 and his adoption of a new conceptual approach parodying this self-same aesthetic. I will also be introducing you to the English Vorticist movement. This movement emerged in London in 1913 and lasted into 1917. The Vorticists published two issues of a journal called Blast in 1914 and 1915. They also contributed art and art criticism to an anarchist journal called The Egoist, which was edited by Dora Marsden. Vortice's leading theorists were the painter Wyndham Lewis and the poet and art critic Ezra Pound. Both of them knew Marsden, and both contributed to her journal. The Vortices also developed a politically charged aesthetic, which I will revisit in the course of my talk. For now, I would like to briefly introduce you to its visual features. As you can see, Vortices' sculptures, prints, and paintings were hard-edged and abstract. They began as real-life subjects, but they rendered these subjects abstractly, often to the point where they became completely indiscernible. Man Ray's interest in Vorticism dates to 1914, when he was frequenting the Ferrer Center, an anarchist-inspired educational project located in Upper Manhattan. And please, I do apologize if I mispronounce any, any names. Man Ray was also uh, was attending the center's art class, which was led by the well-known painter Robert Henri. Here he worked alongside some very accomplished modernists, as well as others like himself who were just starting out. Most importantly for our purposes, the class benefited from the participation of the anarchist art critic John Weixel, who lectured on, quote, the principles of art, unquote, every Wednesday. Weixel propagated an aesthetic he called Cosmism, which was based in part on German art historian Wilhelm Voringer's thesis in Abstraction and Empathy concerning the division of world art into two cultural zeitgeists. On the one hand, there were arts created by empathetic cultures at ease with humanity's relationship to the world. The arts of ancient Greece and Rome exemplified this tendency, which prioritized naturalism over any other factor. <coughs> Naturalism's antithesis was the abstract art produced by cultures such as ancient Egypt that dreaded the world's phenomenal transience, whereas emphasizing artists, empathizing artists accepted the natural order of things, the abstracting artists sought in Voringer's words, quote, to wrest the object out of the unending flux of being and to purify it of all its dependence on life, unquote. Voringer charted a tension over a vast swath of history between two types of cultural systems. However, in his revision of this thesis, 
Weichsel claimed that abstraction in art was the index of the artist's expressive individualism as opposed to a certain type of culture. This thesis first comes to the fore in November 1913 when Weichsel published an article called Cosmism or Amorphism, pitting his aesthetic against amorphous tendencies exemplified in the post-Cubist paintings of the French modernist and future Dadaist Francis Picabia. According to Weichsel, Picabia and others were transforming the modernist urge to abstract into an intellectual exercise in which the rejection of mimesis was turned into a prejudice against any trace of quote unquote concreteness in a desire for a transcendent art of quote unquote pure ideas. Condemning this tendency, Weichsel called on the artist to free himself from social conventions and, in the spirit of a Max Stirner or Friedrich Nietzsche, proclaim he is quote a law unto himself, unquote. Attending to the artwork's formal elements, the modernist could realize an aesthetic synthesis key to his expressive individuality. This would open him up to a consciousness of his creative freedom that Weichsel deemed cosmic. There are considerable affinities between Weichsel's cosmism and the aesthetics of the emergent Vorticist movement in England, Cosmism mirrors Pound and Wyndham Lewis's assertion that abstraction in art was an individualist revolt against societal values. Leading up to the Vortices' publication of their journal Blast in July 1914, Dora Marsden's bi-monthly Egoist was the forum where Pound and Lewis promoted their interpretation of abstraction in art. This important politically, this is important politically speaking because Marsden's journal was the foremost proponent of Max Stirner's anarcho-individualism as codified in his 1845 publication, The Ego and Its Own. To briefly recap, Stirner argued that ideas are indelibly grounded in our corporal being. The egoists, therefore, recognize no metaphysical realms or absolute truths separate from experience. Indeed, the very notion of an unchanging I was a form of metaphysical alienation from the self. Egoism, Stirner wrote, quote, is not the ego, is, is not that the ego is all, but the ego destroys all. Only the self-dissolving ego, the finite ego, is really I. Unquote. Once conscious of its freedom, this self-determining, value-creating ego would inevitably become, quote, self-consciousness against the state, unquote, and its oppressive laws and regulations, Turning to oppression's socioeconomic dimensions, Stirner suggested the degradation of workers made them particularly susceptible to his philosophy. Quote, if labor becomes free, unquote, Stirner suggested, quote, the state is lost, unquote. No conception or belief could subjugate the liberated egoist. As Stirner puts it, quote, there exists not even one truth, not right, not freedom, humanity, etc., that has stability before me and to which I subject myself, unquote. He concluded, quote, I am the owner of my might, and I am so when I know myself as unique. In the unique one, the owner himself returns into his creative nothing out of which he is born. Every higher essence above me, be it God, be it human, weakens the feeling of my uniqueness and pales before the sun of this consciousness. If I concern myself for myself, the unique one, then my concern rests on its transitory mortal creator who consumes himself, and I may say, I have set my affair on nothing, unquote. This is the philosophy Marsden's journal promoted. 
The development of its aesthetic dimensions begins with the inaugural January 1st edition issue of The Egoist. This included a statement on modern art by Lewis, in which he argued painting, quote, geometrically, unquote, and, quote, abstractly, unquote, was the path to an anti-naturalist, quote, transposed universe, unquote. Lewis's article was followed on February 16th by Ezra Pound writing on sculpture. Here, Pound aligned geometric abstraction with artistic individualism in, quote, general combat, unquote, against any claims of sovereignty over the artist, likening abstractionists to aristocrats with a savage approach to life. He concluded that they were, quote, born to rule, unquote, but did not spell out what exactly that meant. We can glean the political import of his formulation from the next issue of The Egoist, where Marsden critiqued the influence of humanist trends in anarchism. Anarchic self-rule, she argued, entailed abolishing the state, certainly, but not the obligation to make one's desires subservient to the betterment of humanity afterwards. Fo rather, following Stirner, Marsden suggested the impoverished strata of society should enact their own liberation by becoming self-ruling egoists, and the sooner, the better. The sternest qualities of abstraction were further politicized by Pound in the June 15th issue of The Egoist. Alluding to Stirner's materialist conception of individuality, Pound claimed Lewis had intensified sensations of struggle in time and of Athens, in a bid to suggest that the intellect cannot exist, quote, without aid of the body, unquote. The sole correlate worthy of comparison with the energy animating Lewis's painterly efforts, Pound concluded, were the forces of, quote, labor and anarchy against capital and government, unquote. By the time the richly illustrated Vorticist journal Blast appeared on June 20th, 1914, sympathetic readers of The Egoist were well primed for the declaration of a new individualist art movement. What then of Man Ray's familiarity with these developments? We can trace his knowledge to spring 1913 when he moved from New York to a small artist colony located just across the Hudson River in Ridgefield, New Jersey. Here he shared a, shared a cottage with the poet Alfred Kreimborg. That summer, Kreimborg and Man Ray founded a literary magazine entitled The Glebe. Soliciting material for the inaugural edition, they contacted Pound, who mailed them the collection of poetry that constitutes Ima Imagism's American debut. Inspired by Pound's contribution to the Glebe, we can well imagine Man Ray searching out his art criticism. And he would not have had far to go. In his memoir, <coughs> Kreinberg recalls the Glebe's publishers ran a bookstore in Greenwich Village, which carried all the latest magazines from London, including, quote, the new free woman, soon to be changed to the egoist, unquote. Over the course of 1914, therefore, Man Ray could have followed developments in The Egoist, and this would undoubtedly have encouraged him to search out Blast when it was published simultaneously in London and in New York. By then, Man Ray was a well-known artist in New York's anarchist milieu who had participated in two Ferrer Center art exhibitions and counted militants such as the anarchist syndicalist sculptor Adolf Wolf amongst his closest friends. Schooled in a range of modernist styles, he was perpetually experimenting, but had yet to arrive at a resolution. The breakthrough came in the, sum, in the late summer of 1914. Shaken by the advent of World War I, Man Ray set to work on a large-scale battle scene which preoccupied him through the fall. He titled the painting War, 1914. In his autobiography, Man Ray recalled that at that time, at the time he composed War, he had, quote, been reading about Paolo Uccello, unquote, 
and studying reproductions of the Italian master's Battle of San Romano, 1438 to 1440. While painting war, Man Ray continues, quote, I never forgot that I was working on a two-dimensional surface, which for the sake of a new reality I would not violate, unquote. So why was Man Ray reading about Uccello? And how did he come to associate the Battle of San Romano with the creation of a, quote, new reality, unquote, in two dimensions? To answer this question, we need look no further than Ezra Pound's appreciation of the vorticist artist Edward Wadsworth, published in August 15, 1914, issue of The Egoist. Vorticism, Pound briskly announced, quote, is a movement of individuals for individuals for the protection of individuality. He then turned to Wadsworth, an artist of pure form, who eschewed naturalism in favor of, quote, the primary media of his art, unquote. Referring to the ship's masts in Wadsworth's print of the Dutch port of Flushing, Pound compared the vorticist, quote, fine organization of forms, unquote, with the arrangement of lances in Paolo Uccello's battle scene scenes. The quality of organization in Wadsworth's print, Pound stressed, resembled Uccello's, quote, for the same reason, unquote. Striving to achieve three-dimensional illusionism, Uccello had been as acutely concerned with the formal qualities of his work as the vorticist. Pound's article inspired Man Ray to consult Uccello, and it led him to study examples of Vortis's painting reproduced in Blast. Compare the hard-edged, angular figures of William Roberts' dancers or the compressed mass of geometric forms in Wadsworth's short flight with Man Ray's composition. Spatial indeterminacy, sharp-edged abstraction, and the claustrophobic crowding of forms within a shallow picture plane are all hallmark features of Vortis's painting, and they leave me with no doubt that Man Ray's quote-unquote new reality was indebted to the egoistic form formalism promoted by Pound. Then there is the question of the relationship between Vorticism and Cosmism. As we have seen, Weichsel was also encouraging modernists to assert their individuality by adopting an aesthetic attuned to the formal qualities of the artwork. In the fall of 1914, Man Ray had done just that, and he acknowledged as much when he dedicated a sketch of war to Weichsel. How then would this new, politically charged aesthetic evolve? Not content with emulating his London counterparts, Man Ray embarked in a new direction. In 1914, he recalls, quote, I changed my style completely, reducing human figures to flat pattern, disarticulated forms. I also painted some still lifes in flat, subdued colors, carefully choosing subjects that in themselves had no aesthetic interest. Unquote. Dance interpretation is an example of this of transformation. As you can see, the style differs markedly from war. Fortunately, the brief comments I have cited from his memoir are not the only record we have of this development. In November 1915, John Weichsel published an article, quote, New Art and Man Ray, unquote, where he discussed his aesthetic in more detail. Man Ray described the, quote, unquote, expressive arts as plastic, quote, parallels to life, unquote, in which the artist simplified and condensed select elements of experience into an, quote, unquote, intelligible unit so as to realize, quote, unlimited self expression, unquote. Arrangements of color and the textual qualities, textural qualities of pigment on a two-dimensional picture plane were static. However, the painter could also subsume dynamic processes in space and time within his medium, just as composers, literary creators, and dancers could render the dynamic elements of their respective arts statically in the forms form of musical notations, a series of words on paper, or gestures frozen in space.
Man Ray's characterization of the artwork as an intelligent unit, unquote, recalls Pound's description of Vortis's painting as a unit in another journal circulating in Man Ray's circle called The New Age. In, the, in early 1915, Pound published a series of articles on the Vorticism aesthetic in painting and painting sculpture literature and music, and in this unitary treatment is analogous with Man Ray's discussion, which also incorporates these arts. Then there is Man Ray's assertion of art's parallel autonomy to life and the integral importance of the medium for realizing, quote, unlimited self-expression, unquote. This recalls the dictums of Pound and Lewis in Blast, that Vortices were marshalling the, quote, primary media, quote, of, unquote, of their work, not to imitate life, but rather to create art with a capital A, a, quote, unquote, non-life, as Lewis put it. This is why mimesis was antithetical to vorticism, and this is why the temporal dimension of life had to be brought to heel. Quote, the new vortex plunges to the heart of the present, unquote, announced Lewis. Quote, with our vortex, the present is the only active thing. Life is the past and the future. The present is art, unquote. Likening the, quote, polished dance, unquote, of his paintings to an, quote, unquote, immobile rhythm, Lewis imperiously concluded he was letting, quote, life know its place in a vorticist universe, unquote. And so too was Man Ray. Consider, for example, Invention Dance, the work Man Ray chose to illustrate the exhibition pamphlet of his first one-man show at the Daniel Gallery in November 1915. This painting arrests a dancing figure in three discrete moments in a bid to subdue the illusion of temporal movement in favor of stasis. Eschewing the passages of modeling that figure so prominently in war, the colored forms are flat, fragmentary, and transparent. Man Ray intensified the two-dimensional properties of the picture plane by profiling his figures against a jagged black area that looks like it has been cut from paper with scissors and pasted onto the canvas. Textural passages, arbitrarily employed, heighten our awareness of the work's self-sufficiency. As Man Ray relates in his statement for Weichsel, a painting, quote, is materially identified by the color and by the texture of the pigment. These qualities cultivated in themselves replace the illusion of matter by parallel realizations of matter and satisfy the tactile sense. So the essence of painting is preserved in the flat plane, unquote. Invention Nativity, also completed in 1915, pursued the same end. Here, a central mat, black figure with outstretched arms is bisected by a superimposed orange-yellow body fragment. The rest of the work is composed of painted cutouts and rectangular forms that are integrated into the picture plane so as to showcase the work's two-dimensional quote-unquote essence. In March 1916, Man Ray exhibited Invention Dance with Invention Nativity, Invention Promenade, and a fourth Invention in a select exhibition of work by American modernists at New York's Anderson Galleries. On this occasion, he published a statement that again suggests he was tracking a vortice's trajectory. Quote, working in a single plane as the instantaneous visualizing factor, unquote, wrote Man Ray, the painter, quote, realizes his mind, motives, and physical sensations in a permanent and universal language of color, texture, and form organization. Accordingly, the artist's work is to be measured by the vitality, the invention, and the conviction of purpose within his medium, unquote. Note that, quote-unquote, instantaneous visualization is a central feature of vorticist aesthetics as codified by Pound's definition of the image, quote, that's which presents an intellectual and emotional complex in an instant of time. Unquote.
Furthermore, Man Ray's assertion that the intensity of quote-unquote invention is the index of a painting's worth, an assessment which he applied to his own work, reiterates Pound's summation of the Vortices' position in the January 28, 1915 edition of The New Age. Quote, The test of invention lies in the primary pigment, that is to say, in that part of any art which is peculiarly of that art, as distinct from the other arts. The vorticist maintains that the organizing or creative inventive faculty is the thing that matters. Superficial capacity needs no invention whatsoever, but great energy has, of necessity, its many attendant inventions." Unquote. Vorticism led Man Ray to prioritize the picture plane above all other concerns. However, in late 1916, this formalist edifice began to crack. The impetus came from Marcel Duchamp, a former Cubist who had settled in New York in the summer of 1915. Duchamp had read The Ego and Its Own and shared Man Ray's desire to realize egoistic individualism in the artistic realm. However, he was developing his project in a quite different direction. Inspired by Stirner's condemnation of the ego's subservience to metaphysical concepts and social norms, Duchamp had come up with an anti-art concept, the ready-made, which departed from the production of art altogether. Duchamp's ready-made, such as his infamous fountain, deliberately undermined the socially imposed conventions that defined art. Devoid of any trace of the creative process, the ready-made was an unprecedented challenge to aesthetics and much else besides. From an egoistic perspective, this had serious implications. Man Ray had adopted the precepts of vorticism in a bid to realize, quote, unlimited self-expression, unquote, but now he was forced to consider, from a sternest perspective, how vorticism was pinning him down to exercises in painterly formalism from which there was no exit. Vorticism was premised on a tension binding the creativity of the artist to the qualitative properties of the medium. However, Duchamp was intent on con corroding art's ontological viability and its formal properties by bringing the public and their subjectivity into play as generative components of the formation of the quote-unquote art object. In Duchamp's variation of egoism, the flux of Stirner's shifting, decentered I was complemented, complemented by anti-art productions that were equally unbounded and undetermined, contingent things of discourse rather than qualitative difference. I date Man Ray's response to the challenge, to this challenge, to early 1917, when he submitted a mixed media work self portrait for inclusion in his second one man show at the Daniel Gallery. Self portrait was composed of a canvas featuring Man Ray's handprint to which he attached two electric bells and a push button. It evoked the idea of a door. However, this door did not open, nor did its doorbell ring. Man Ray later recalled the consternation of the many quote-unquote visitors who pushed the button over and over expecting the bells to ring and then complained about the faulty wiring. <laughs> the gallery goers were distressed by Man Ray's lack of seriousness. However, his assemblage was actually a carefully thought out renunciation of Vorticism's formalist underpinnings. Self-portrait gained its expressive power from the ideas it evoked in the confused minds of the public rather than the aesthetic impact of paint on a flat surface. Here, an intersubjectivity attuned to Duchamp's conceptualism was underlining that the autonomous qualities of the canvas were decidedly beside the point. In a related development, in early 1917, Man Ray also adopted the mechanical device of the airbrush and began creating such works as My Firstborn and Theater of the Soul, Suicide. In his memoir, he recalls his delight as he sprayed away, quote, with no need of an easel, brushes, and all the other paraphernalia of the traditional artist, unquote. Bidding conventional painting adieu, Man Ray circumnavigated the material of the art object so central to vorticism. 
Quote, I was more interested in the idea I wanted to communicate than in the aesthetics of the picture. When I discovered the airbrush, it was like a revelation. It was wonderful to paint without touching the canvas. This was pure cerebral activity. Unquote. Theater of the soul also has a thematic dimension which relates to Man Ray's passage beyond vorticism. The work was dedicated to Russian director Nikolai Evreinov, <laughs> author of a one-act play called Theater of the Soul. Evreinov was a master of parody who, pu who had published an attack on theatrical illusionism called The Theater as Such in 1913. <laughs> Here he argued that theater should be quote-unquote pre-aesthetic and expose its artifice rather than hide it. Theater of the soul showcased this idea. The play's uh, subject is the psychological trauma of a married man who commits suicide over a failed love affair. Three actors stand in for components of the man's being, which are introduced to the audience by a professor. <laughs> Drawing on a black background, blackboard, the professor explains that the integrity of the soul is a myth and that we are actually composed of three elements, the rational, the emotional, and the subliminal. In this way, the title of the play is revealed as farcical. It is actually a parody of the idea of a soul and an expose of how conventional theater misrepresents our true nature. In the play, the rational entity argues the man should be true to his wife. The emotional entity tells him to follow his love for a cabaret dancer, and the subliminal entity slumps in a chair and says nothing. The action takes place in the interior of the distraught lover's body, with lungs, a beating heart, and lines of nerves that the emotional entity constantly plucks. Whenever the strings are plucked, bells erupt, lungs pulse, and the heart beats more quickly and loudly. Stressed by constant arguing between the emotional entity and the intellectual entity, the body grows more and more agitated as the play progresses. When the emotional entity reveals that his protests of love for the dancer have been rejected, a struggle ensues with the rational entity, who recalls his wife's condemnation of the affair. The emotional entity strangles the rational entity and then shoots himself in the chest. The heart spews blood onto the stage, at which point the subliminal entity rises from a stupor and leaves yawning. <laughs> Oh, I gotta see that play. <laughs> uh, in his notes for the play, Evretinov describes the course of these events as lasting half a second, leaving the audience to conclude a theatrical depiction of an instant in time is itself a parody. Man Ray depicts the professor's blackboard suspended between the protagonist entities, which are connected to nerve strings on pulleys. Considered from an egoist perspective, this is a superbly ironic expose of the contingency of identity and the materialist basis of our psychic life. As for aesthetics, formalism, and vorticism, a play that transgresses theatrical illusionism is much like an airbrush painting that transgresses painterly values at the same time as it remains emphatically a painting. In sum, the integrity of the medium is being sidelined so as to expand the range of Man Ray's inventiveness, an affirmation of egoism in other terms. This is not the anti-art iconoclasm of Marcel Duchamp's ready-made, but rather a parodic assertion of creative license over the aesthetics of vorticism. Having sacrificed formalism on the altar of egoism, Man Ray would now find his own way, Dada style, in the years to follow. Thank you. Erin, thank you so much for reading that for us. That's great. Uh, are we going to uh, try to patch in Alan at this point? Should we try and keep the questions to about 10, 15 minutes so we don't fall, so we can catch up a little bit of time or... 
I'm uh, I'm here. Oh, hi, Alan. Hi. hi. Thanks, Aaron, for that reading. <laughs> so, Alan, what we're going to do is we're going to begin with some of the students uh, asking sure. some questions if they have them, and uh, and then we'll proceed for about ten or fifteen minutes or so. Okay. Okay. Do any of the students have anything to to ask? Does anyone else have anything to ask? I don't know. Is it? He won't hear you. Sorry. This I have is one. David. The, 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 it's, hi, Alan. It's David Christopher. Um, hi, David. I have a question that you're, you're going to wholly disapprove of because I, I don't think I have... Uh, there was so much going on there that... Uh, uh, Things which with with which I'm not familiar, I was really taking history notes more than theoretical notes. Okay. Um, and because nobody else has a, a particular uh, question to to just jump off with, I have one that that you you might be able to answer with a yes or no. But have you seen this new? I think it's a Disney movie about the personification of feelings inside uh, a little girl's head. No, I haven't seen that. Well, <laughs> that'll that'll pretty much end where I was going with that then. Um, <laughs> We'll come back to that in our discussions in the future, I'm sure, then, Alan, and I'll, I'll, uh -huh. I'll open that to somebody else now, then. Okay. Uh, can I ask a question? Of me? Uh, no, I was thinking of Brandon Taylor. Please proceed. Yeah, I was uh, curious about truth and deformity in modernism. Um, could you tell me a little bit about how those two terms figured in your talk? <laughs> Uh, because I'm, you know, I'm dealing with an undermining of these formalist values in the name of parity, a kind of mirroring of a truth and a renunciation of it at the same time. Could you use the microphone, please? Sir? <clears throat> Did I hear you correctly talk, describing these as formalist values? Uh, at least that's what I was dealing with, but uh, that's why I was... Sure. I was just looking at our theme here, mm. uh, which makes this claim about uh, modernism being autonomous and uh, associating that autonomy, particularly in the case of Clement Greenberg with formalism, and then uh, the invitation to explore the way in which that was complicated uh, and unraveled, uh, <clears throat> both before Greenberg and after, I guess. Um, I, I, you didn't hear my talk, did you? Because unfortunately, no. Um, I didn't talk about, I didn't mention or even talk about, let alone think about, formalism, Clement Greenberg, uh -huh. autonomy. What else did you mention? I <laughs> think you. Woo! Okay. I, I'm sorry, Alan, I'm not responding because I didn't talk about any of those matters. I wonder if anybody else can help Alan with that. There is a different question coming up, so hang on. This is uh, from Sam Rose, and then we have Astara, and then we have Karun. Hi. Hi. I just wanted to ask something about the way that you're reading Man Ray and Dusham slightly. Uh -huh. it's kind of Differentiating their projects, um, mm -hmm. as I see it with Duchamp, there's this kind of shift to the creative act coming from the audience in a way. They are yes, completing the work well. and so on. Um, but how does this play out with Man Ray's own creative license? To what extent is he also losing control of the work of his own kind of ability to interpret it as well? Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, is he then kind of sharing in the best of both worlds, this free creative egoism of his own making and also this creativity of the audience, each kind of individual who comes to encounter their, his works getting to make them for themselves? Yeah. Or, yeah. you know, how does well, that work out? Well, what strikes me about Man Ray is that he's, he's persistent in creating work, whereas Duchamp, um, is withdrawing more and more in terms of his presence within within the, the little bombs that he tosses out into the world. 
Um, and so when I when I was examining uh, when I think about Man Ray's uh, um, data identified productions from this era, um, I think he's working off of his prior formalism and uh, these values that he associates with egoism, and he's not letting go of uh, of of creating work. Um, but through his photography, he certainly um, starts. Uh, how to say? For example, the uh, the photograph of the gun and the magnet. Um, that's a photograph of these two ele- these two objects that he broke apart afterwards. So the uh, the artwork itself um, was ephemeral; it doesn't exist, but it exists as a photograph. Um, so you know, Duchamp throws the urinal away. Uh, he doesn't even you know keep it or anything like this. Manry seems intent to. Um, Maintaining a trace of his artistry, even when he's when he's working with materials that, like the lampshade that he cuts and leaves dangling, and so forth, uh, which he creates a replica of it after a janitor came in and thought it was a piece of junk and threw it out from the exhibition where it was supposed to be displayed. Um, so I see a persistence in Man Ray in terms of wanting to maintain the production of art, whereas Duchamp is moving away from even doing that. Does that help explain? Yeah. Um, those that's, are my thoughts anyway. That's great, thanks. And I think we have a question still from Astara. Hi. Um, yeah, I just had a question um, kind of looking at Man Ray's um, works and this, it's more specifically about his kind of history of his artistic expression and media that he worked in. Um, mm-hmm. I was really intrigued by, because I wasn't previously familiar with his work, um, so I was very intrigued with the fact that his works are all very two-dimensional, but yet he's incorporating so many kind of references to sculpture and music and theater, and it's very multimedia in its references. So I was curious um, if he had worked in other media or what his background was in other artistic forms. Well, he developed as a photographer, for which he's most well known, as a as a job. Uh, he was hired by Catherine Dreyer, who uh, who formed a uh, exhibition society and hired Duchamp to advise her. And this is in like 1920, 21. Um, Man Ray was hired to uh, photograph the work in her collection. Um, and he started experimenting more and more with photography during that time. I think there's a relationship between his rejection of um, formal values key to the canvas and his adoption of photography. There's a certain fascination there um, in terms of f- photographs being a uh, arrested in time and space uh, representation of reality, uh, which the artist in a way frames passively and simultaneously manipulates. Um, but uh, at this time, the milieu that Man Ray is involved in uh, are engaged in all sorts of things. I mentioned that Man Ray is publishing a journal called The Glebe, which is devoted to poetry. Um, Alfred Kramberg, who's collaborating with him, is not only a poet, he also does puppet plays. Um, at the Ferrer Center, um, they have, uh, they put on plays, they put on exhibitions, um, there's many things going on, uh, musical performances as well. So, Man Ray is exposed to all these various kinds of art. Um, yeah. So we have a question from Karun and then from David. Hi, Alan. It's it's Karun. I wanted to get back to this sort of uh, uh, anarcho individualism, this uh-huh. the idea of the individual and and um, the ego above any kind of transcendent reference point or or perspective or transcendent I. I I'm trying to recall. Is that a is that uh, something that is kind of a political program um, in in any way? Can you relate it to some of the journals that that, that you've been mentioning, or is that simply just his own way of kind of overcoming um, 
like you, you mentioned this sort of formalism of, uh, uh, you know, the, the highest expression and the pigment of the medium and now moving on to these uh-huh. assemblages. Is, is it sort of part of his creative artistic practice or is it kind of like a deeper conviction, a commitment to, to egoism kind of as a, as a way of life? As a politics. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, something that I wasn't able to fully communicate, um, but I can articulate it now, is that uh, the this anarchist I- individualist politics, as it unfolds in in the United States and also in uh, in England and Russia, um, is tied to the anarchist movement, and so. Dora Marston, for example, condemns World War I and simultaneously talks in, in, in a kind of cynical way, I think, about how the masses of people are still being drawn into a nationalist narrative. And she holds out faith that perhaps after people experience the trauma of war, they will awaken to their own self-interest. They'll have an egoist political epi- uh, epiphany and uh and reject the authority of the state and the you know orders to go to war so, so there's a there's a ver- there's a volatility there rooted in this idea of the liberated individual which egoism rests its case on another thing about egoism that we should keep in mind is that it's a radically materialist philosophy of individuality and in that sense, it's going against the predominant values of Christianity, which certainly are tied to state power during the time we're talking about. Um, egoism could also be a vehicle for all sorts of turning over of moralities. And um, in the enactment of these politics, as a politics of individual liberation, they willy-nilly become social. Um, one of the paintings that I showed in my talk, Invention Dance, is actually profiled in a conservative art journal in the United States called Art and Progress, right after World War I is declared and the aesthetic of Man Ray is condemned as an example of the anarchism that we have to stomp out in America as part of the war effort. So you see, the, the politicization of egoism is not only enacted by the people engaged with it um, in the anarchist movement, it's also recognized um, by social and political forces that are opposed to anarchism, that see it as a threat to the nation state project and the war certainly during World War One is central to that project. Thank you, Alan. I'd, sure. I'd just like to wrap this up in five, ten minutes. And I know we've got three questions, so we're going to go to David, then Dana, and then Brandon for the final question. Okay, I'll try to be very quick. Alan, when I read uh, The Ego on Its Own, you know, I found Stirner's position on sort of the radical material, corporal ego, easy to understand and, and his anti-statism that, that comes out of that. I did find that in places the text to me felt very much like it, it maybe descended into a sort of paranoid anti-social existentialism in places it felt to me he might, might have taken it too hard. That argument notwithstanding, I know this was addressed in what Aaron read, but I'm trying to make, um, perhaps in your own voice it would be a little bit clearer. Can you articulate again how, how does Stirner's egoism sort of specifically inform via vorticism, this, this post-cubist flattening aesthetic in Man Ray's early work. So, so the very formal aspect of the, the, the flattening, you related to the egoism, and I'm, I'm missing that connection. Can you explain that again? Well, he's, he sees the, um, let's say, uh, using his term, invent- invention, you know, the creative invention of the artist working with pigment on a flat surface as... Um, as a conjuring out of the self, uh, with his emotions as well as his intellect involved in the process of a uh, world parallel to the world in which we exist. So, um, 
So the impetus towards formalism is about originality, um, freed from mimesis. Um, in that sense, it's it's liberating. Dana? Uh, hi, Alan. It's Dana. Um, I'm just going to kind of jump off uh, from Astara's question on uh -huh. the different medias that he used. Um, I was wondering, do you find uh, this idea of egoism, does it come up in his films um, starting in the 1920s and on, or does he kind of depart from that idea? Oh. I can't comment on that. I haven't looked at his films closely enough to to uh to comment on that. You know, I think of Man Ray in the nineteen twenties as being increasingly drawn into the surrealist movement and a whole set of other concerns. And the final question from Brandon. Uh yes, well one one last question which might help conclude discussion for this morning, it's a large question in a way, which is, is anarchist individualism in the form you present it compatible or not compatible with any form of collectivism? Um, I would say it is. Uh, he, he contributed two illustrations against the war to Emma Goldman's Anarchist Communist Journal, Mother Earth, uh, during 1914. Um, his closest friend, Adolf Wolf, who is a sculptor, identified as an anarchist syndicalist, and also at the same time was creating sculpture that was keyed to these egoistic, formalist ideas. Um, I don't draw a hard and fast line between um, anarchist individualism and uh, and collectivism because what I've discovered as I've researched um, the anarchist movement and its intersections with the arts is um, is that these people who identify as anarchist individualists are constantly um, combining forces and cooperating and trying to collectively realize their politics. Um, so that's, that's, that's what I've observed in practice. Oh, yes, Betty uh, is going to ask a question. Sure. Hi, Ellen. Hi, Betty. I'm not very familiar with the term vorticism. Could you just give it to me in your words, please? An, an explanation? Okay, um, it's a term that was coined by Ezra Pound. And the image of the vortex is um, a intense energy that has a still center. And at the st center of the creative energy of the vortex is the individual. That's the metaphor. Um, in terms of the vorticist movement, it emerges in, the, in England in 1914, and it lasts into 1917. Uh, there are two exhibitions in in uh, in London, and there's another exhibition in New York, actually, uh, that they uh, hold. Uh, there were women and also men involved in the movement, uh, but the movement coincided in terms of its enunciation with the issuing of the Blast Journal with the beginning of World War One. And so in that sense, uh, it had a very fraught and fractured trajectory. Um, as this vorticist or that vorticist gets conscripted or uh, drawn into the military effort in Britain, um, it ebbs. Well, I just want to uh, thank you very much, Alan, for your paper. Thank you very much for um, coming to talk to us over the uh, conference call as well. How is your foot, by the way? It's in a cast, and <laughs> it's feeling better. <laughs> and I really wish I could be there. I'm oh. sure you're having a wonderful time, everyone. We miss you. And this is just the beginning of uh, of two days, so... Okay, well, thank yeah. you, thank you very much, Alan, and thank you also, Erin, for, for reading the paper. Okay. Bye.